I have to say, this, start to stand in front of you. Um, honestly, this um, is one of my favorite uh, things about Cannes. Um, I had the privilege of being uh, part of the panel last year, and it was by far and away the most sort of uh, transcendent and inspiring um, thing that I was involved in. So thank you for coming. And by the way, congratulations to all of you. Give yourselves a hand with your drink in hand <laughs> for having been among the chosen. It's really awesome. Um, and apparently there's five more this year than last year. Um, this is five years running, is that correct? Uh, see it, be it. Really, um, the purpose is, is really important to us. Um, our global president, Mike, in the back, uh, is a huge champion uh, of women. Our executive creative director, Frederick Bonn, I call him the biggest feminist in the office, uh, and I mean that sincerely. He's an incredible uh, champion of women. And I was more than delighted to have Emma uh, take the seat this year uh, moderating this panel. She, Emma Armstrong, is our brand new managing director in our New York office. She happened to meet the two criteria which is the best candidate and a woman. So she's six weeks into the job. So uh, uh, with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the panel. But once again, thank you so much. We are delighted to host this. And just a volunteer to Chloe, um, a volunteer, our space, our time, our efforts, our anything to the cause, because it's really important. Welcome. Um, I hope I can live up to the hype. So in the spirit of changing things up, we met uh, for the last 45 minutes and talked about the panel and some of the things that we had talked about um, using as topics. And we decided to, to change things a little bit because when we spoke last week, um, we realized that we don't have the answers. Um, we have some thoughts. But you guys have been here for the first three days of can now. Um, did you guys arrive on Sunday? Yeah. Um, and you've been living and breathing this. And you also live it and breathe it every day within your own companies. So we wanted to change the format a little bit. Hopefully that's OK, Emma. Um, we didn't tell you. Women are very adaptable. So we're going to, I'm going to kick us off with a question for the panel. But then after we've answered a question, we're going to open it up to questions. Then we'll go back to another question and then hear from you guys again. So because, you know, we've... One of the things we discussed, we've all been on a lot of panels, we've all sat through a lot of panels and sat through a lot of great discussions, but if there's one thing that's so important um, now, at this moment more than ever, is really taking action. And we've been talking about this for a long time, I think 2018 really, um, with Me Too and with a lot of other things, is the year of action. So. If you guys leave with one thing that you will do differently um, that came out of this panel, I think we've we've probably done our jobs. So that's okay. That's what, that's what we're going to do. So um, before we begin with a tough question, I'm just going to ask each of my fabulous and very accomplished panelists to quickly introduce themselves. Um, maybe just talk a little bit about what your role is now and um, and you know why you can why you can change things and what what that role enables you to change. I guess. Hi, I am another Emma. I'm also English. Um, I live in Los Angeles and I'm executive director of Free the Bid. Oh, yay! Sometimes I look around and I go, ah, oh, they don't know what it is. <laughs> Although sometimes I say, unless you've been living under a rock, you will yeah. not know Free the Bid. So, yeah, I'm, I didn't found it. Let's make it very clear. The founding of it uh, was Al Maharel, who's an extraordinary force of nature, a director who felt very personally uh, and, and, you know, in a very kind of really, really lived it, how little opportunity she had as a woman director, albeit on a roster. So, you know, she's, she was able to be represented uh, by Epoch. But, uh, you know, realizing that all of her friends, a lot of men, a lot of other women directors, that the women around her and her, she herself were not getting the opportunities, the same opportunities, just to compete. Because no one, as a woman, wants to be given a job because they're a woman. Um, they want to be able to, the, you know, compete on a level playing field. So Alma set this up, and I know you know this, but I'll just put it into timelines because it's important. In September 16, uh, Free the Bid was born. And what that was was Alma uh, paying for, literally, paying for a website which had a handful of women directors who were all represented by production companies because then she could go here they all are uh, because often the, the the agencies that took the pledge i.e on every triple bid at least one director is a woman bidding 
So when she said that to a lot of agencies, they were like, oh, we'd love to work with more women. There's only Catherine Bigelow, and she doesn't really do any ads anymore. I mean, literally not even joking. I know it sounds absurd. So she said, well, here they all are. So here they all are at that point was 75 women directors, I think roughly, uh, that were all represented by production companies. Um, I met her in December 16. She asked me to run for the bid, and I said, no, thanks. And then a month later, for my own personal reasons, another story, I decided, of course, I needed to run for the bid. And then... Uh, immediately um, added many, many more women directors, you know, and globally, and we're expanding globally. So there's a lot more I could say, so I don't get me started. So I think that's probably enough. And obviously what we're doing, the question, answering the question, what are we doing? We are basically addressing a systemic bias, systemic. And what I really mean by systemic is every single point of that pipeline has inherent biases. Some are pure misogyny when you come to the auto industry, just saying. Uh, others, are, you know, which is in the 1950s, basically, and I've got some very, you know, strong evidence of that. Uh, others just laziness, uh, time poverty, just, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. All of that shit, you know, and, and it's systemic, even to who wins awards and who's written about in the media and all of the rest of it. And, it, you know, when we say women directors, we mean really inclusively women directors. So we have an enormous, you know, constant uh, proactive finding of women who aren't just white women, black, brown women, women from all over, women. We asked recently, somebody asked us if we knew any trans directors. You know, <coughs> we are constantly, like, anthropologically searching for the talent. We serve it up. We don't get anybody a job. We don't represent anybody. We don't. We got no skin in the game. We're just like here. They all are. And then I spend my whole time going look at this website. Everybody use it and hire these women. Oh no, not hire these women. Bid these women. Allow these women to bid. Allow these women to compete. And in doing so, given that the creative departments are still only 11% women, we will then allow those predominantly male creative departments to listen to different perspectives. It's really vital. And then the added bonus of all of this is that we're actually aligning with the Unstereotype Alliance and the See Her Initiative, which I'm sure you all know about, which me, who are really out to address the stereotypical, you know, sexist in some cases, just reinforcing gender stereotype, um, you know, media, given that this is the ins most insidious, wonderful, insidious media, those those perpetuating of stereotyped images have to stop. And one of the things that I was luckily able to point out is that if only 7% of those commercials are, are directed by women, yeah. it, you could do a lot better by having at least the point of view of a woman who can whistleblow on any kind of sexist or stereotypical, you know, potential exactly. situation that's going to go out into the world. So, so we're sort of across all of that. But again, the word is systemic, every single facet, from the reps to the production companies who represent so few women. I say this to them. Uh, so few women, you know, I call it the one club and the none club because they'll have, we've got our one woman, why would we want more? So, yeah, systemic. That's and what you have to really address. I every Crack it open, every single perspective, every single angle of it. I think every single woman here is nodding along and saying a huge big hi. Well, thanks to everybody for knowing about it. And literally, we are t <laughs> Alma is on a feature film, so she's incredibly busy. I run Free the Bid. And even though I got a fancy title, which would sort of somehow make you suppose we had a staff of several people, there's one other person called Chloe. And she's back in LA because we can't afford to bring her here with me. So I just briefed her on a yep. social media post. Yep. And that went out. She's just doing that now. So we're tiny, but we're mighty because you're all now ambassadors to Free the Bid. Please feel engaged, go to the site, pay it forward. Wherever you end up working, take Free the Bid with you. And if that's an ag agency that hasn't officially pledged, you can actually be the person that makes the pledge happen. There you, you go. Can, Within you know, the first five minutes, it, you action. have your action. <laughs> Renee, thank you, Emma. We can leave now. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. You've covered it. Who knew it would be this uh, easy? No, 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 no. I'm, that was... Lovely, and thank you. And eBay are very early supporters of yes. Free the Bid. Yes. Thank you, eBay. Yes. So, Renee Blake, uh, CCO of eBay. And so, my background is primarily agency side. So, with IPG uh, Hacker Group out of Seattle. Um, and then, after that, out of Atlanta, Moxie from Publicis, just to give you just some context there. And then, uh, for two years, I've been CCO at eBay. So, I'm somebody who has you know, long history of agency, and now I'm coming to the client side. And <coughs> I think that has given me a unique perspective um, relative to this issue. Uh, you know, on the agency side, I was extremely passionate, and, and I just worked so hard 
to, to do all of these things and, and to, to champion that in our organization, in the work that I did, and it was hard. And now being on the client side, I feel a new perspective. I have new power. So uh, using the example of free the bid, it's very common for the agency to bring me, um, you know what, because of time, because of money, because of whatever. We know that you're a part of this free to they, like They know that they're going to have an issue, and they, but we just really didn't have time. Um, and I, that's not good enough. And so they go back, and then they come back with the female directors. So same is true for casting. Same is true for all of these things. So um, pretty interesting to see it from both sides now. So um, I continue to march forward. Thank you. Hello, my name is Sarah Harrison. I, I work at Vice. Um, my background is I started out in um, two lifestyle um, publications. I went to an agency and then I came to Vice to sort of marry the two. Um, I've been very involved in the women's, um, we have a, a group called the Women's Community Group at Vice um, and I'm one of the executive sponsors and so to me, um, this is all very relevant and important. And one of the things that I really value is being visible to the women in my company. Um, we organized a lot of um, different things during um, Women's History Month, and one of the most successful ones was a panel of different women across the company who were in very senior leadership positions because one of the things that we had heard um, from younger women was that they sort of knew that there were women in leadership positions, but they hadn't seen them, that the ones that they saw were all men, um, <coughs> and the people that they heard from were all men. So we went across the various divisions of Vice, um, which include our digital business, our Vice News on HBO show, Virtue, um, Vice Land, our TV channel, and we found some of the most senior women, and we organized a panel, and it was extremely well attended, and we got incredible um, feedback from it, just people saying, it's so amazing to hear from these women and to hear their stories and to hear them speak and to see them, just to know that they exist. Um, and so that's one of the things that feels really important to me because I've also experienced that um, in thinking about um, representation. And it's obviously very relevant to this group. Um, and that's one of the things that I really, like for example, when we have all team meetings at my company, I make sure that I speak. Um, because I know that it's extremely important for people to see a woman speaking. And, I, and then I get that feedback. People say to me, oh, I love when you talk. It's so great when you talk, um, instead of all the men talking. Um, and so that's, that's just a, an easy thing, I think, for people to do, just to speak, um, to have your voice heard, and no matter what level you are, um, to make sure your voice is heard. And that's something that each of us has distinct power over and, and can do. I'm going to steal that as an intro to my first question. Um, as I, I'm not browsing the internet, I'm checking through my, my carefully prepared questions that we threw out 20 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> so one of the things we talked about, um, and actually this came from a program that you're launching at, at Vice, um, Heroic Failures, is that? Oh, um, uh, oh what is it? <coughs> um, high Powered Fails. High Powered Fails. It's a show, it's going to be a show. I don't know if it's out in the public yet, so please keep this to ourselves. Sorry, on our on our um, <laughs> our channel our channel called Broadly, which is our women's, um, and it's expanding now to be women in LGBTQI um, vertical. So you can sign the NDA on your way out. Um, one of the potential unspoken challenges around this subject is that women in power can either be invisible or sometimes unapproachable or um, forbidding, and I think. Certainly when we talked, we felt that we had all had to um, be a little closed off sometimes um, to get ahead in, in our careers. Um, I'd ask each of the panelists to tell us a story about maybe your high-powered fail um, and you know, in the spirit of sharing and vulnerability. I can start. Well, <laughs> you have I a good one. <laughs> well, I have two examples, and neither of which feel high-powered, high by the way. Um, I didn't feel high-powered in the moment, I'll say. And um, we talked a lot about it was, um, it was, it's great for you to hear the steps that we took that, that got us here that were positive. And we talked about it's even more powerful for you to hear the missteps that we took. And so that's why we kind of threw some of the stuff out and brought this forward. And so the two examples I have, the first one is, is truly embarrassing um, for me that I didn't 
react differently. So uh, the example I have is that it was a new executive creative director, fairly new, and um, he thought it was great to joke around with everybody, he thought it was great to drink with everybody, and it was a Tuesday at 11 a.m., and he kind of pushes me in his office and he says, take a shot. And um, I very stupidly took a shot with him because he was like, 17 levels above me and he was a new person that I wanted to impress I wanted to get the next account that I wanted and I went along with it and I really should have um, We've talked about different ways to prepare yourself for, for those type of situations to just say, you know This isn't appropriate. I don't want to and and remove myself the second one is a little bit more friendly in the workplace um, where I had a manager that would uh, filter for me the opportunities that he would give to me because he was very well intended and he would um, tell me after the fact you know I wanted to send you to that brand summit but I didn't want to take you away from your family um, I, I wanted to put you on that account but this was going to be nights and weekends and I didn't want to do that to you because I care about you and so here was a manager that was extremely well intended and I was really I really struggled with that and I had, there was um, a series of small little things like that that I would have with my manager where I was trying to compensate. I was trying to then shrink, show less of myself, whether it was through my presentation style where I would reference my, my family as, you know, as part of my presentation or um, if I needed to leave early, not using my family as the reason why, things like that, right? Like these are all things that happen. Um, and instead, what I would do today, my, my misstep, was that here I had a well-intended male manager that wanted to support me, and I did not do a good job at articulating what it is that I needed from him, and what support, what true support was for me. And so that's not his fault, that is my fault. So that's my misstep that I would share that to, um, most males want to help. And we just need to be very specific and purposeful with what it is that we need from them. Can I jump in there? Because one, one thing that I think is so, like you have to actually know what you need for support. And that can be actually very hard yeah. to know. And so I think a lot of people go through something like that and think, like there's, there's something off about this, or I, you know, I, there's, there, you feel a little discomfort, but it's like a buried feeling or that you feel that something is wrong, but you're not necessarily sure what to do about it. And so I think, I don't know, I don't necessarily have a piece of advice for that, but I think just to be aware that when you do feel like something is off, something is off. Um, and it might take some kind of introspection or talking to a friend or a mentor just to figure out what that is and then to define it. Because you can't yeah. ask for the support that you need unless you know the words to use and unless you know what that support actually is. And so that's an important step to take, I think, to define that. And it's, it's okay to get it wrong, and it's okay to go back and fix it. Because I think rare, very rarely are we, pre are we prepared in the moment. So it's, it's fine to stumble and then go back to it. That, that would probably be something I wouldn't always do either. Mm -hmm. And now I do a better job at bringing back the uncomfortable part, because all we want to do is bury it. So you bring back the uncomfortable situation and say, you know what, I should have handled this differently, but I'm going to do it right this time. That's okay, too. Yeah. I, th I think there's a, I, I love that, I think there's a tendency to assume that everyone else, I don't know if you guys can relate, everyone else has got their shit together yeah. and you are the person that's struggling through it. Yeah. Finding people, men and women, to talk about, the more you unbutton, the more you can make yourself a little more vulnerable the more you'll find out that no one has any of the answers. And That's you know the imposter syndrome, isn't exactly. it? Exactly, exactly. Do you, um, before we open it up to a few questions, um, Emma, do you have any? A high-powered fail. High-powered fails. I, do, I don't really think I have any power, but I have got a few stories. Um, I've, never, I've never really climbed in any way a corporate ladder. I've never had any real letters around my name, and I've never gone up to the C-suite, but you know, I'm now in the C-suite the whole time. It's great. I'm just not a C-suite, I'm, I'm an executive director, which we made up, so it's fine. Um, but you know, I guess by, by association, by osmosis, I might have some C-suite credibi credibility. But So I guess what 
I did. I was the photo director of Dazed and Confused magazine for a long time, um, if any of you know that. And I knew a photographer called Taryn Simon, who's really extraordinary um, and a force of nature. And she's, she's in the art world. She was in the editorial world and she transitioned over to the art world. And she's very purist and very art world. And very her work is incredibly sort of meaningful and politicized. And it's, it's brilliant work. And I'm very good friends with Nike. And Nike used me as a, well, w I collaborated with Nike as a creative, um, a creative, not a director. I'm always worried about these terms because I'm not a creative director. I'm, I'm a kind of creative enabler. So I was a creative enabler for Nike. And the, um, it's a guy called Ma uh, Nigel Powell, who's an English bloke at Nike, said to me, okay, I've got X amount of hundreds of thousands and I need an image of the Redeem team. You know the the Nike the the basketball team that went to the Olympics and it was called the Redeem Team and this incredible moment where he said who do you want to shoot it and you know so I was like Taron Simon I want to use this artist and Nike were really into that so I was like I'm going to use Taron Simon and what happened was this extraordinary adventure where we flew to Las Vegas and then we had 20 minutes with the Redeem Team and it's one of the most the hugest experience of of my life because it was so daunting and these giants came into the room and you just, and then there was me and all of the, uh, all of the managers and all the sports people and all of those dudes, they all sort of disappeared. And then it was me just sort of sounding like the queen going, oh, hello, <laughs> excuse me, could I get you all in a row? You know, and it was me and Taryn <laughs> Simon. And you had people like, you know, oh God, looking at me like, what the fuck is going on? And we had them li lined up as if they were in an old school photo. And they were mucking about. And I was like, shh, keep it quiet. Keep jolly quiet, you know, <laughs> and all this. And then LeBron James went, oh, everybody just calm down. Shut up. Let's just do this photo because we're going to practice. And he just looked at me and I was like, oh. you know, literally you're, you're being stared down by the Olympic basketball team. I'm not very tall and they're like twice my height. So got this shot. It was incredible. Taryn uh, worked on it. She was happy with it. And what I learned from it was that I hadn't really sussed her out because she'd transitioned from this commercial photographer into being this artist. And I hadn't done due diligence and I hadn't really spelled it out to her. I'd just gone, yeah, great, we're gonna do this. And she then said, they can have the image, but they have to take my name off it. And it was, this is very NDA by the way, and Nike were devastated because that's like, I mean, Nike are, you know, for them, they're an extraordinary company. And obviously I'm a huge, you know, I've drunk the Kool-Aid there, I'll admit it. And they are always gonna be the sports brand for me and the performance brand. The, and I had to mediate this relationship between the two of them. And I'm even dying inside now. And the thought of it was like, and she just resolutely dug her heels in. And I respected her for it, but it was, I felt like I was caught in the middle. And they were like, why is she taking her name off it? We're not going to run it without her name because it's part of the story. We're really, you know, it was a shit ton of money. We're really happy that she's doing this. And then she just felt that that was taking herself into a compromised situation. And I think the lesson was... Uh, obviously, that's a huge ambition to mediate, and I really still have that ambition to mediate between art and commerce and break down the silos and, you know, all of those things. I don't like siloed worlds, especially in the creat creative worlds. And I was just over-optimistic and over-ambitious, over and I died and died and died in sleepless nights and punished myself and thought, you fucking idiot, you've ruined your big relationship. And then the lesson was that actually Nike came back to me and they didn't punish me and they didn't even run the image. I mean, that's... They couldn't, they wouldn't, and so uh, honestly, that is a really NDA situation. I shouldn't even be telling you, but that was the moment where I really think that I learned so many lessons. Mm -hmm. And then you come through it, and then you go, well, you know what? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, as my mum would say. So you learn. It's not the best way to learn, but it's it's good. It's good. If failing upwards, and maybe or failing sideways I in that case. I love the uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Maybe um, we have a couple of. If anyone here has any tips or tricks or anything that they've learned I around the subject or yeah, anyone want to contribute? They seem so keen at the beginning and now they're not so keen. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to keep this moving. Um, hold your point. Oh, no, you have. No. Nope. <laughs> she hand raised for you. Then you won't stop? All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask another question. Um, so another thing we talked about, um, and hopefully you guys will agree, and I might call on Fred, who's sitting at the back, looking like he's not going to be called on, um, is that this is not a problem we can solve together. Uh, we can solve alone, sorry. We can solve it together. Um, men play a huge role. And I think if we're not careful about how we approach the conversation, um, there is a chance they'll become disenfranchised and disconnected. Um, so 
question for, for you guys, and um, maybe we can start with you, Sarah, because I know that you um, are particularly keen on this advice. Um, are there any programs or tips and tricks that or tactics that you're putting in place or that you've seen work in other places to truly engage the entire community mm -hmm. um, around, around gender parity? Um, well, I'm keen on this just because I'm trying to figure out the answer to this. Um, and I don't actually have the answers, but I can talk a little bit about it. I mean, during, so we put on a series of lunches at Vice that were um, women-only lunches. Um, because we wanted to create a space where women felt like they could really speak and we wanted to understand what their experience was and how we could improve their experience. And we didn't feel like people would necessarily talk about negative experiences they had had if there were men present. And that turned out to be true for those lunches. Um, we had some amazing conversations and, um, and I th people did share th pretty intimate details of uh, experiences they had had that wouldn't have come out if it had been a mixed gender situation. But in those lunches, we also did talk about how do we involve men. And I, and I, I don't think that we came up with the answers. And so I'm, I'm happy to have this discussion. I, I mean, one thing I can say is that when we did panels, like the one I talked about earlier, there were a lot of men in attendance. Um, and that was really encouraging to see because I think that the men wanted to be there and wanted to participate and wanted to show support. Um, and they didn't necessarily know how. And so I think that just opening up spaces um, to men um, and, and listening to them. Um, another thing that we, um, that we talked about is potentially having male-only spaces because there are times when men might not, they want to participate, but maybe they don't want to sound stupid or they don't want to, like they're not necessarily sure that um, what they're going to ask isn't going to be really offensive, so they just don't ask it. Um, so that's another thing that we're potentially talking about. We work with a, um, a bunch of different groups and one of them has a facilitator um, whose name is Wade Davis and he was um, a, a man, uh, first gay man in the NFL to come out and now he, d he works with men. Um, and so he has suggested that and we might do something like that with him where we kind of bring small groups of men in and do have conversations similar to the one that we, we had with all women. Um, but yeah, I don't have the answer to this, and I think it's an extremely important question to figure out how do we move this together, move this forward together. Do you, any of the current, ah, see, you there have questions, go. good. Um, do we have a spare? Awesome. You have fabulous sunglasses. <laughs> Hello. Um, you're all super inspiring, so thank you for sharing your stories. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question about, about Vice and that what are you talking about? Those systems, and they sound really interesting, but I think Something that I kind of wanted to ask you about was the way that I if you think that it's troubling separating the conversation like that and siloing it off, because actually another thing that came to mind when I knew you were going to be on the panel was, you know, I would love to know the percentage of women that work on broadly and then the percentage of men that are in the main part of Vice and mm -hmm. how that impacts the work and if actually we should be encouraging more cross collaboration so we can all be answering it together. Mm -hmm. I work at Refinery29, so it's like all chicks. Yeah. But we do have a lot of men that work, especially on the branded side, and actually the, uh, the perspective that they can bring to work that maybe would feel incredibly close to a woman is really uh, like objective and clear. And I think actually when we ask them to solve it with us on a practical day-to-day -day basis, it can be amazing. Yeah, I mean, for this series of lunches, we talked a lot about should we have it be men and women or should we just have it be women. And for this, these particular lunches, we decided that we wanted to have it only women. Um, because we really did want to have a space where people could share things that um, they wouldn't share in a mixed yeah. gender group. And so that's, and we got such incredible feedback from the lunches that we decided to continue them, but with mixed gender for that reason. Um, in terms of your other question, I don't know, there's, Broadly has male and female um, uh, employees. I think it's mostly women. The publisher is a woman, the editor in chief is a woman, um, but there are men writers on the Broadly staff. Um, and we do have throughout the company, uh, you know, I don't, uh, I don't actually know off the top of my head kind of the vice.com versus the broadly ratios. Um, but I do know that there are a lot of women in senior positions within the editorial staff um, as well as men. I know that doesn't exactly answer your question. Well, we will get this. We'll get the stats and get back to you. Um, 
There's a question. One, well, I'll take one more from back there and then uh, I have another question for Renee. I have a broader question, actually, and <laughs> anyone can answer that. So the thing is, uh, back home, I've had lots of discussions and arguments with uh, the men that I know. So what they think is that with all this, uh, we are getting a lot more sensitive about, oversensitive about a lot of issues. And they think that we're in, after a point of time, we're going to stop yeah. having fun with work, stop having fun. So, uh, and this he said when he was uh, defending a sexist joke that he cracked, and I was guilty of laughing some four years back, and I really regret that I did that. But what are your views on it? Do you think we're getting a little oversensitive? Because I don't think so, because, so, and it's interesting that men, all the men seem to believe that. So, is there? Uh, um, I'll jump in, but definitely if somebody else has a, another thought on it. If you look over history, any issue that was a, a new issue, there was always a group of folks that said, are, have we gone too far with this? Um, are we doing it for the sake of it, which is the wrong reason? So take the example of a creative, an agency, a lot of times as I was working my way up, whether or not I was the person or I was trying to promote somebody else in, um, I would get accused of show showing favoritism to females for this issue. That, that's just one example. And um, so I don't, I'm okay with that. I, I, did you want to say something? Um, I, you know, I'm okay with us doing it for the sake of it because yeah. if you look at history, that is how things happened yeah. and we shouldn't shy away from that. Yeah. Um, I do absolutely believe in bringing everybody along. Um, these are not gender specific issues yeah. that we're talking about. The, the numbers tend to be with certain genders, which is why they lean a certain way. But um, I, I shared an example where all along the way, uh, yes, most of my mentors were male because those are the ones that were there. But then the few females that were there, the reason why they were, they had found s these particular ones, the reasons why they had found success is because they were adopting a more conventionally male um, leadership style, the way they used their support system, the way they set up their families were more similar to how men have been successful. So I just say um, bring it all in um, and, and we, we just need to talk about it because it's it, I'm not, we should not shy away. We should not be embarrassed about it. I am also assuming this is going to blow over a bit. I think we were talking about it. It's like um, you look at the work, everything's about this, all of the panels are about this, and then so much so that's why we decided to throw out some of our topics because we're like, we're tired of saying the same thing. Everybody's tired of hearing the same thing, and it's not helpful. Like, how do we get it into action? So um, I want us to challenge a different way of doing it. One example that, or one tip that I have as it relates to helping a male to help you. First of all, get rid of the word help and support. And um, another panel that I was on, I was, it was lovely. I heard all these fantastic stories about the sisterhood and the support and your community and you gotta go find your community. And I'm just like, first of all, that's a lot of pressure. How do you even find these people unless you're at CAN? Do you even have time? Yeah. Who has and time? And I have no like time for a community. If you're already lucky enough to be at CAN, you got something working for you. So like we're not even talking about the, you know, to the right people. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm very deliberate when I say we need to articulate what the thing is that we need to be supported with. So I'll go back to that. Um, the second thing is, is that it is helpful. Sometimes it is language. What it is that we're looking for is to be valued, not appreciated. And I think it is a very normal and comfortable thing for a male to support us through appreciation. So it's normally going to come to us in that way, which of course is lovely, but what we're actually asking for is to be valued. And so if we can just do that one shift, so it's the language that we use or the, the thing that we're asking for, the policy that we're asking for, the negotiation that we're asking for when we walk in before we get the job, it's, it's expressions of being valued, whether it's compensation or time or effort or whatever that is to you. 
rather than being supported or do you understand? Am I making yeah. sense the difference between the two? Okay. <laughs> that was a resounding right. yes. Okay. That was and that was a great answer. Thank you. Um, I can't see your face. I'm sorry. Do you have a? Oh yes. Yeah. Last night at the award show, I don't know if you've seen the work, but I saw this work that done with the people with Down syndrome. They opened this restaurant, and all the people that run it were people with Down syndrome, and they invited f people from the government. And at the end of the dinner, they uh, when they got the bill, it said there was this note saying that the the bill is on us, and the l changing the law is on you, and. I, when I was thinking that why that made that moved my feelings was that because they were acting like servant leaders, like they were this diverse group, but they were including the people who are actually more powerful than them. So whenever we are just this group of ladies, I'm thinking like, are we feeling like are we making f men feel like they're outsiders? So. I'm thinking like, should we include a few men yes. so that yeah. maybe yeah. they feel included so they're going to be messengers who go back home and they're going to be telling about, there there are these amazing ladies and they were talking about this. Because uh, I know this is amazing. It I, I I feel like a warrior when I'm <laughs> whenever I'm with women, but I feel like we're just discluding the, all those men. Completely. Because whenever I'm in a group of men and I'm, whenever I'm amazed by other men, I feel like, I, I just want to run to other females and I just want to talk uh, to them about how I was influenced by men. So I, I just want to ask this you if this is... Uh, you know, Anne, for sure, and we talked a lot about this, I'll let the, the panelists jump in. Anne had a great word for this, which is man vangelist, <laughs> which, um, you know, feel free, there you go, another gift for you guys to take and, and use. But, but absolutely, I mean, Emma, Th as you started Free, free the, the Bid, you must have... Yeah, no, I didn't start it, Alma started oh, it. Always now you run that. it. Um, I just run it. Um, so Free the Bit, by the way, that was directed by Danielle Levitt. She's a woman. That spot yeah. that you're talking about. Um, she's fantastic. So Free the Bid is not punitive. It's not whistleblowing. It's not Me Too. It's not Time's Up. Yes, people say, wow, you must be really profiting from all that. And we're like, no, what, are we ambulance chasers? No, we just want to offer a creative solution to marketers and their brands to do more more work that will actually appeal to 85% of the consumer. Decisions are made by women. So, you know, really it's about offering a creative solution to fast track, you know, uh, people's knowledge of, of women directors and consider them for jobs. So we, we, of course, have to speak to mostly men. Let's face it, the industry is full of mostly men. And obviously the industry itself within the agencies is doing everything they can to push for diversity and bring people up and and put more women in the C-suite and all of those things. But we just talk to whoever the stakeholders are. Um, so yes, of course, we're talking to most heads, lots of heads of production, men and women. Uh, creative directors, men, and hopefully more women. You know, so, and actually we say man ambassadors as well. We have, some of our biggest supporters are men. Um, I do recognize that, you know, I find myself in situations like the IPG breakfast this morning. That was so great. There was like five men in there, you know, and it and it's starting to even get to me a little bit because I just want normal. I want <laughs> I want there to be normal. I want it to normalize a little bit. And we hosted a film for um, a screening for an incredible film, which you should all see, uh, although it's devastating, uh, called Half the Picture. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Amy Adrian is a director, a documentary director who very prescient started filming interviews with with Hollywood directors and uh, women women and they're talking incredibly mo in a very very moving very honest way about what's happened to them in their careers and what they've had to overcome and Miranda July is newly a mother when she interviews her and she literally cries at the thought of leaving her child you know really emotional and I don't you know there was most of the the, the people at the screening in LA were uh, where I'm based were women from the Free the Bid website, you know, women directors, and, and it was fantastic. But I was like, no, this needs to be all men, because I really believe that those, you know, we're all playing golf together dudes, actually a lot of them don't want to be that. They're, they are actually faking it as well. Yeah. They are put, their society is putting as much pressure on them to be that 
And I think that they would also be emotional about that film and actually it would really serve them well to watch it, to really try and empathetically understand what it is that women do go through. And I'd rather not be the one telling them that. I'd rather other, you know, other people were telling them. But they will also hear it from women directors and, and other ways of it becoming normalized. And it's about empathy and it's about really realizing that you, what you are, you can't ever imagine what it is to be like to be another. You know, you just got to listen. You got to hear. I can't imagine what it's like to be black, but I do everything I can to find black women to put on the site yeah. and listen to them and tell their stories and understand and speak for them because I have to pay forward my my privilege. I am really privileged, but mm -hmm. I'm doing everything I can to understand, you know. And I think that's what we all everyone should do. Include of course, and every IPG breakfast shouldn't be all women. It should actually be, you know, I mean, I'm well sure they're moving towards that. They did say that anyway, but so yeah. Does I that answer the question? Okay. It, it doesn't. I, oh, yeah, well, I was please. just going to say, just to keep the accountability mm -hmm. in the right place, um, to put a sharper point on it, that was one of my missteps, <laughs> that when I got called to put on this pan to be on this panel, I thought it and I didn't say it. No, we, we talked about it. it. We, we almost co-opted Fred and he yeah. had a lucky escape, but we should have had a match. Did he just leave? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> he's there. No, he's there. Don't worry. I thought I saw you leave. <laughs> no. I was like, oops, oh dear, and, we've and offended one of my him. Missteps. Um, but it, so well. since I was on two panels, and now I have the the on this subject matter, and both times the panels were all female, and most of the, the audience was predominantly female, and so that's mine. I should have done that, and and that is something that each of you can do as well. Well, we're also all white, no, yeah, which is wrong. That's right. You know, that's right. <laughs> sorry, this is wrong. I'm a yeah. terrible we moderator. No, I no, also no. Own this. But, but unless <laughs> you actually, no, no, unless no, you no, actually no, no. point these things out, it can happen. You know, yeah, like yeah. like with you know the way that honestly, free the bit. I should be out of a job soon. Please let me be out of a job. We don't want to have to point this out, but people are literally waking up to the fact that s at the CMO level, uh, and I can tell a story at the CMO level. They are going. Oh, God, I've been asleep at the wheel. I've just realized. I, I'll tell you a story. Uh, this is a free the bid sort of related thing as well, which will... You can, you can tell a quick story because I'm getting so frantic notes from, from behind that we who's have... A, who's noting you? No, no, we, ha we have one more time for one more oh, question. Oh, sorry, tell sorry. A quick story, though. Can I just tell... Because it's such a good one and it really does Otherwise spell we'll out what, how night. free the bid can actually work. So, and I want you to all know this, you know, and, and again, speak about this because this is how it can make a difference. So, Antonio Luzio, our godfather, the godfather of free the bid is the CMO of HP, Hewlett Packard. And he came across, he's basically diversifying his agencies, and that's BBDO and Giant Spoon and Fred and Farid and, and a couple more. And he's like, listen, I'm not going to work with you unless you diversify within your agencies. I don't want it to be just white men I'm talking to. Do something. Make a difference. So he puts them under pressure, and they start doing that internal stuff. And then he says, by the way, while you're at it, you have to sign up to the pledge to free the bid. So this is November 16. I'll tell it really quickly. November 16, and he gets really focused on it because he wakes up to the fact that he's been given, you know, agencies have given him their recommend. And I know that's the way it goes. You're busy, everyone's time poor, and it's your job to recommend. But this CMO decided that he wanted to take a bit more notice of his, as to who was actually uh, bidding and therefore, you know, directing the spots that he was paying for. He has the checkbook. And so very simply, he just admitted two weeks ago, which is a gift to us, because it's literally what we need to talk about. Business. We're not at this for a moral high horse thing. It's not a moral imperative, obviously. It's not philanthropic. It's not poor women need to do this. Of course, women need to have the equal opportunity to earn a living as male directors have that opportunity. But for him, it's business. And let's talk business. That's how we speak to people, and that's how people take notice. So the business of it was that he realized that prior to November 16, when he came across Free the Bid, and he had this like moment of wake an awakening, zero of his commercials had been directed by women. Zero. And that's probably because zero women were being bid on those commercials, and zero women were in the pipeline in all those agencies. And he looked at them, and he s kept you know, breathing over their, looking over their shoulder, and every time BBDO, he said it publicly, so I'm not, you know, I'm not throwing anyone under the bus. Every time BBDO went, here's our three, we have to tell you three people? Okay, here's our triple bid, here's the three dudes that we're, and he's like, hello, what do you not understand? One of them has to be a woman, go back, go back, go back. And he got really good at it. And so very quickly, this is what ended up happening. So from November 16, all the way up until two weeks ago, he paid for 53 commercials. Antonio Luzio, CMO of HP, 53 commercials. I mean, he doesn't have billions to spend. He has millions, but it still counts. 53 commercials were made in a year and a half. And because of the pressure and because of the waking up and the realization and the agency, this word agency, that people decided to have about this issue, 
59% of those commercials were directed by women. So it went from naught to 59. We just gave him the tools, the very simple tools. We said, here's this funny thing called Free the Bid. Here's a website with all the information. We'll do everything we can to get all those women into a pipeline. But if your agencies don't then go onto the website and actually have some commitment to it, as you know, then it's not going to work. So it is all about human beings. And back to that, it's mostly about, most of my interactions are with a lot of men. Of course, they have to see the realization. But when then Antonio says 59% of those commercials are directed by women, and it moved his bottom line. The profit margins moved. The engagement, the empathetic, you know, sort of belief in that company has changed. That's now the perfect way that I can go out and speak to a world of business, whether that's men or women. I can speak business to these people. I don't want to speak, hey, women, hey. I want to speak business, because that's going to move the needle. Absolutely. And I think we might be out of time. So I'm going to so let... Sorry. No, you were wonderful. No, oh, Can't my gosh, you were all myself. wonderful. So... I want to say a massive thank you. Um, you know, we have all grown up in a very male-dominated world. Um, we talked about being held accountable. We agreed to hold each other accountable. You should also hold us accountable and hold each other accountable for um, for, for change, because otherwise it, it won't happen. And hold your hold your friends and hold your your male counterparts accountable. So, thank you. Congratulations.